Hello, my name is Nadia Bodkin, and I am the CEO and one of the founders of Blaze Therapeutics, a nutraceutical and responsible distribution company. Today, I have the honor of discussing cannabis therapeutics, what we know so far. By way of background and transparency of my other affiliations, I have been a patient advocacy professional in the rare disease advocacy landscape for the past 12 years, and most recently joined the global community-based effort to organize the community landscape as being separate from the advocacy landscape in order to establish real-world accountability and stop the exploitation of so many well-intentioned people seeking to use their lived experiences to change lives for the better within the rare disease community. I became a community-based activist for the rare disease community through the co-founding of the rare advocacy movement and uniting with various activists from the disability, neurodivergent, and medically complex communities. Anyone interested in learning more about community-based activism, feel free to reach out to the rare advocacy movement directly. The website is www.rareadvocacymovement.com. I'm also one of the founding members of Nula Ventures, and I'm the founder and board chair for EDS United. Before proceeding, I am required to share this message with all of you from our legal team. Unfortunately, the message is more like an essay, so instead of taking up all the time I have today reading this legal disclaimer, the summarized version of this legal disclaimer establishes that Blaze Therapeutics reserves all rights to this presentation and that no part of this presentation is to be duplicated, copied, or reproduced by any party without the express written consent of Blaze Therapeutics. In short, Blaze Therapeutics is a nutraceutical research and development company seeking to establish a more responsible, holistic product industry. Our team at Blaze Therapeutics does doesn't believe that the current recall process provides the appropriate protections that most medically complex consumers require. Our research has even found that most holistic branded products that are identified as needing to be recalled have already been consumed or applied to the body. As a result, Blaze Therapeutics acquired a responsible distribution system that prevents a product that needs to be recalled from ever being sold to the open market. Blaze Therapeutics is the world's first responsible distributor of consumable products and currently still the only distributor practicing responsible distribution. You can tell a product has been responsibly distributed if it has the signature responsibly distributed seal applied to its packaging. Even though Blaze Therapeutics is not exclusively distributing cannabis-derived products, we do specialize in cannabis therapeutics and distribution. To understand the current cannabis market, it's important to understand its taxonomy and how it's classified. Debate as to the classification of cannabis, however, has swirled for more than 250 years. Because all cannabis types are capable of crossbreeding to produce fertile progeny, species differentiation amongst cannabis varieties do not follow basic taxonomy principles. Those of you who have been engaging within the cannabis market will notice the use of the term strains, which is typically acceptable with respect to bacteria and viruses, but not amongst plants. So while the marketplace will continue to adopt street terminology for branding and marketing purposes, which is quite honestly the byproduct of the federal government depriving the public of accurate scientific information as it relates to cannabis. Instead of referring to cannabis types as strains, the medical setting is referring to them as chemical varieties or chemovars. Given that such factors as plant height and leaflet width do not distinguish one cannabis plant from another, the healthcare professionals and other scientific professionals have chosen to characterize cannabis types by their biochemical and pharmacological characteristics, thus the term chemovars. Additionally, the classification scheme supported by systemic chemotaxonomy taxonomy suggested separation of cannabis sativa L, cannabis indica lamb, and cannabis ruderalis gen, which has become generally accepted throughout the cannabis marketplace as well. Regarding understanding the difference between hemp and marijuana, at this point it has become practically common knowledge for cannabis enthusiasts that the 2018 Farm Bill redefined the term hemp and effectively launched the CBD open market. Unfortunately, the terminology that differentiates hemp and marijuana is not rooted in any scientific fact. Hemp originally was defined as the male cannabis plant, non-flowering, which has been grown all over the world to produce food, oil, fiber, and other sustainable products for generations. 2018 U.S. legislation changed the definition of hemp to include the female cannabis sativa strains, officially excluding hemp from being defined as marijuana under this new definition. This updated definition of hemp decriminalized all of the components and byproducts of the hemp plant. Additionally, in August of 2019, the DEA announced the 
the recognition of this law decriminalizing the small amounts of Delta 9 THC found in hemp's flowers and hemp derived products as long as the flowers and or the products derived from the plant do not contain any more than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. The inclusion of the flowering cannabis sativa L plant in definition of hemp was vital for the birth of the CBD industry because CBD can only be extracted from the cannabis flower. CBD cannot be extracted from hemp seeds. It is also important to note that as a result of this legislative definition change, marijuana is now defined under federal law as any cannabis plant or derived product that contains more than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. And consequently, any cannabis plant or derived product that contains less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC is classified as hemp. To understand why the study of phytocannabinoids are so important to both the medical and veterinary healthcare practices, it is vital to step away from the legislative environment and towards biology. The human body consists of 13 distinct biological systems that carry out specific functions necessary for everyday living. In reviewing the simplified functions of each system, one can quickly surmise that most systems functions are reflected in the name. For the sake of today's discussion, we will skip past the first 12 biological systems to the endocannabinoid system, which has the function of maintaining homeostasis for the other vital systems of the body by either upregulating or downregulating biological mechanisms in response to internal and external influences on the body. The endocannabinoid system was first discovered by Dr. Lisa Matsuda and colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health in 1990. And today, we now understand that the endocannabinoid system is responsible for maintaining homeostasis for several vital functions, including sleep, mood, appetite, hormonal response, pain response, immune system response, and more. As both internal and external environments affect the body's baseline state of balance, the endocannabinoid system is there to correct things when they swing one way or the other. By understanding the biological concept of homeostasis and how the endocannabinoid system may maintains this at the cellular level, we can more deeply appreciate why the body has an endocannabinoid system to begin with and how a variety of cannabis-derived therapeutics might actually work. The presence and critical function of the endocannabinoid system across many systems of the bodies, including the nervous and immune systems, explain why such a wide variety of ailments and disease states are responsive to cannabis therapeutic interventions. There are three key components of the endocannabinoid system. One is the cannabinoid receptors, which are abbreviated CB receptors. The most commonly studied CB receptors are CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. Secondly, endogenous cannabinoids referred to as endocannabinoids, where the four most studied endocannabinoids are anatomide, 2-AG, vanilloids, and oleamide. And thirdly, metabolic enzymes. The most actively studied enzymes of the endocannabinoid system are the fatty acid amide hydrolases, which are abbreviated FA, and the esterases. The CB receptors belong to the class A G protein coupled receptor family and contain seven transmembrane domains with extracellular and intracellular binding sites. CB receptors transmit information about changing conditions to the inside of the cell, kickstarting the appropriate cellular response. The two major cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, aren't the only cannabinoid receptors of the endocannabinoid system, but were the first ones discovered and are currently the most studied. While both CB1 and CB2 receptors can be found throughout the body, CB1 receptors are the most highly expressed G protein coupled receptor in the human brain and expressed predominantly in the central nervous system. CB2 receptors are more abundant outside of the nervous system in places like the immune system and hematopoietic cells. Endocannabinoids, the cannabinoids that are endogenous to our bodies, are substances derived from long chain polysaturated fatty acids originated from their degradation by phospholipases, which are activated by calcium ions. In other words, the body makes several endogenous cannabinoids, which function within the endocannabinoid system. Endogenous cannabinoids are stored in lysosomal vesicles in nerve endings due to their highly lipophilic nature. Their production and release occur on demand due to the physiological needs of the body. Two well-established endocannabinoids, anatomide and 2-AG, as well as a few others, serve as intercellular lipid messengers and have been identified in nearly all tissues of a wide range of animals. In 1988, specific receptors were discovered in the brain for delta-9-THC, which is abbreviated THC. 
THC for the sake of the illustration, which initiated the hunts to find the brain's national analog of THC. The brain's natural analog of THC was isolated in 1992 and later called anatomide, which is abbreviated AEA. Anatomide is synthesized in all animals and has even been found in truffles. Anatomide has a long hydrocarbon tail, which makes it soluble in fat and allows it to easily slip across the blood-brain barrier. It's responsible for the natural high experience and has been nicknamed the bliss molecule. Anatomide is synthesized enzymatically in the areas of the brain that are important in memory, thought processes, and control of movement. Research suggests that anatomide plays a role in the making and breaking of short-term connections between nerve cells, which is related to learning and memory. Animal studies suggest that too much anatomide induces forgetfulness. Outside of the brain, anatomide acts as a chemical messenger between the embryo and uterus during implantation in the uterine wall. Therefore, Anatomide is one of the first communications that occur between mother and child. Due to the similarities between THC and anatomide, scientists have raised the possibility that THC may interfere with signaling between the uterus and the embryo. So experiments involving mouse embryos exposed to THC-like compounds have shown them to have a significantly lower survival rate than normal, as well as exhibit a number of abnormalities. Therefore, the consumption of cannabis during pregnancy is strongly advised against. Once anatomide enters a cell, it is rapidly degraded by single hydrolytic enzymes present in most tissues, except for in the skeletal muscle and in the heart, called fatty acid amide hydrolase, abbreviated FA. FA belongs to a large family of enzymes that share a highly conservative 130 amino acid motif, termed the amidase signature sequence. Interestingly, a second enzyme of this type, FA2, has been found in humans and other primates that is absent in mice and rats. In evaluating the structure of anatomide and THC, researchers have found that THC is a relatively robust molecule, whereas anatomide is fragile and it breaks down rapidly in the body. Since anatomide breaks down so rapidly in the body, it doesn't produce a persistent natural high. As with anatomide, 2-AG is synthesized upon demand. Evidence also suggests that 2-AG is the more influential natural ligand for both the CB1 and CB2 receptors. 2-AG not only has higher intrinsic activity than anatomide for both CB receptors, it is also present in higher concentrations than anatomide throughout the body. Subsequently, it was shown to be especially a dominant in the central nervous system with concentrations in the brain averaging 170 to 1,000 times greater than that of anatomide. However, it has a short half-life as it is rapidly degraded by actions of esterases. Indeed, many of the important activities of 2-AG are expressed through brain metabolism. Increased levels of 2-AG is found during fasting in the limbic forebrain and hypothalamus, suggesting that 2-AG is responsible for the regulation of food intake and energy metabolism mediated by the CB1 receptor. 2-AG is also important in modulating anxiety, depressive behaviors, and addiction. As a natural lipophilic molecule, it is theorized that 2-AG can diffuse freely through membranes to reach the sites of activity since no active transport system has been identified to date, although it does bind to systolic carrier fatty acid binding proteins. In addition to its own well-established biological activities, 2-AG also acts as a precursor to other bioactive lipids. Endogenous bioactive lipids governs all immune processes. They are secreted by basically all cells involved in inflammatory processes and constitute the crucial infrastructure that triggers, coordinates, and confines inflammatory mechanisms. Because of the time constraints, I won't go into vanilloids and oleamide, but they are also very interesting and well-studied endocannabinoids. The cannabis plant is known to contain more than 500 compounds, and among them, over 113 cannabinoids appropriately termed phytocannabinoids. Including the phytocannabinoids, cannabis chemical constituents, including about 120 compounds, are responsible for its distinct aroma alone. These plant essences are termed terpenes, or when modified terpenes then become terpenoids. So terpenes and terpenoids are a large and diverse class of organic compounds produced by a variety of plants, particularly conifers, and even by some insects. Terpenes 
and terpenoids are the primary constituents of the essential oils of many types of plants and flowers. In the cannabis plant, all phytocannabinoids are phenolic terpenoids biosynthesized in the acid form. For example, Delta 9 THCA, CBDA, CBGA, CBNA, etc. In order to neutralize the acidic phytocannabinoids naturally synthesized from cannabis, they must be decarboxylated. Traditionally, cannabis has been decarboxylated via inhalation and other burning practices. As the flower of the cannabis plant is heated, the naturally occurring acidic phytocannabinoids are then decarboxylated to their neutral forms, delta 9 THC, CBD, CBG, CBN, etc. Cannabidiol, abbreviated CBD is a popular phytocannabinoid predominantly extracted from cannabis and has been shown in the clinical setting, excluding anecdotes, to be a powerful anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety, anti-epileptic, anti-emesis, a neurological analgesic. The list goes on to include improving the symptoms of PTSD, reduction of the withdrawal effects of heroin addiction, and even inhibition of cancer growth and metastasis for lung, colon, and breast cancer, all without exerting a psychotropic effect. CBD actually functions as an allosteric receptor modulator, which means that it can either enhance or inhibit how a receptor transmits a signal by changing the shape of the receptor. Generally, we find that CBD's actions are mainly indirect, that its primary role is enhancing the effects of anatomide. CBD is an anatomide reuptake inhibitor, which means CBD keeps anatomide concentrations in the synapses at a high level. CBD is also an inhibitor of fatty acid amide hydrolases, which you may remember is abbreviated FA. Anatomide is degraded primarily by FA, located in the postsynaptic neuron. Therefore, in addition to increasing anatomide concentrations by inhibiting the cell membrane transporter-mediated reuptake of anatomide from the synapse, CBD also slows down anatomide degradation. And remember, anatomide is the bliss molecule. CBD also acts as a positive allosteric modulator of the GABA-A receptor. In other words, CBD interacts with the GABA-A receptor in a way that enhances the receptor's binding affinity for its principal endogenous agonist, GABA, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the mammalian central nervous system. By way of reference, the sedating effects of Valium and other benzodiazepines are mediated by GABA receptor transmission. CBD reduces anxiety by changing the shape of the GABA-A receptor in a way that amplifies the natural calming effects of GABA. As you can see from the illustration, CBD doesn't bind to the CB1 receptor directly in the traditional lock and key style, like Delta 9 THC does. CBD interacts allosterically with CB1 and changes the shape of the receptor in a way that weakens CB1's ability to bind with Delta 9 THC. As a negative allosteric modulator of the CB1 receptor, CBD lowers the ceiling on Delta 9 THC's psychoactivity, which is why people don't feel as high when they use CBD-rich cannabis compared to when they consume Delta 9 THC dominant products, often found in the indica chemovars. Thanks to all of the scientific literature and duplicated studies that we can now reference, CBD has been shown to activate central nervous systems, limbic and paralimbic regions, which can reduce autonomic arousal and feelings of anxiety, even reducing the anxiogenic effects of THC during accidental overconsumption. CBD has been shown to have anti-emetic, anti-inflammatory, and antipsychotic effects. Studies are looking for potential benefits of phytocannabinoids in the management of neuropathic pain, hypertension, post-stroke neuroprotection, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, cancer, and so many other conditions, most of them classifying as a rare condition. It is well established that purified CBD given orally produces a bell-shaped dose response curve where an optimal therapeutic response is obtained using 25 milligrams per kilogram of purified CBD, while higher or lower doses have less of an effect, which complicates its clinical use. It's also really important to note when adding CBD to a therapeutic regimen that there could also be drug interactions. CBD is metabolized by cytochrome P450 and UGT enzymes while functioning as a competitive inhibitor. So CBD can cause pharmaceuticals to metabolize slowly, meaning they'll stay in the bloodstream for longer periods. In the case of some drugs, that could have a positive effect. For instance, a smaller dose of opiates may be needed in combination with CBD to experience the same effect as a larger dose of opiates without CBD. The same 
may be true for chemotherapy drugs. CBD could lower the amount of chemotherapeutic agents needed for treatment. However, there could be some serious drug interactions like that which happens with warfarin. CBD reduces the enzymatic degradation of warfarin, thereby increasing its duration of action and effect. A person regularly taking a CBD-rich product should be monitored closely for changes in blood levels of warfarin and other similarly metabolized medications. Because CBD is also metabolized amongst others via the cytochrome 3A4 enzyme, this could lead to slower CBD degradation and consequently higher CBD doses that are pharmacologically active for a larger period of time if taken with drugs that inhibit the enzyme, like ketoconazole, retinovar, clarithromycin. In contrast, drugs that induce cytochrome 3A4 like phenobarbital, rifampicin, and phenytoin consequently reduces CBD bioavailability. Bioavailability of a CBD product is largely determined by the properties of the dosage form, which depend partly on the design and manufacturer. Differences in bioavailability amongst different CBD products and even batches and lots of the same branded CBD product can have clinical significance. Thus knowing whether different CBD product formulations are equivalent is essential. Orally administered CBD products, capsules, and gummies must pass through the intestinal wall and then the portal circulation to the liver. Both are common sites of first-pass metabolism that occurs before a therapeutic agent reaches systemic circulation. Thus, many CBD products are metabolized before adequate plasma concentrations are reached. Low bioavailability is most common with oral dosage forms of CBD because CBD is lipophilic and slowly absorbed. Additionally, a 2006 study found that lipolysis, the release of fat-stored phytocannabinoids into the blood, is enhanced by food deprivation or exposure to trauma or stress. In contrast to the purified CBD bell-shaped dose response, where CBD has a very limited dose range, whereas no beneficial effect is achieved at either lower or higher doses, orally delivered CBD dominant marijuana extract shows a dose response curve, which is a much easier therapeutic to dose. In order to get a dose response curve, the product has to have at least 1.1% Delta 9 THC content, which automatically legally classifies the product as marijuana. No CBD product on the open market derived from hemp is capable of producing a dose response curve. If they are bioavailable, and unfortunately our studies show that is dependent on several factors, then dosing is subjected to the use shape dose response curve where everyone has their own range where they can achieve optimal effects and this optimal range is dependent on an individual's percent body fat. As a result of the scientific understanding currently available to date, doses of up to 1,500 milligrams per day, as well as chronic use of CBD, have been reported as being well tolerated by humans. Some other key factors affecting CBD bioavailability include the product's inactive ingredients. If there is sugar added to the formulation, you now have the added factor of the inflammatory response from the sugar to deal with. Therapeutic products should not have any added sugars. Unfortunately, most products available on the market add sweeteners in an effort to make it more palatable. For the informed consumer, a sweetened CBD product is a red flag to its therapeutic potential. Body weight and body fat percentage is something I discussed earlier. It is important to note that all phytocannabinoids are lipophilic and as a result are readily absorbed and stored in the body's fat cells, also known as adipocytes. If someone recently experienced a traumatic event that releases adrenaline into the bloodstream, studies have shown that stored phytocannabinoids, and yes, that includes THC, from previous cannabis consumptions are released into the bloodstream from adipocytes. This is why some people test positive for having THC in their bloodstream after a car accident, even though they didn't ingest any cannabis within recent months. Additionally, studies have shown that consuming CBD with a high fat, high calorie meal increases the maximum or peak blood serum concentration concentration five-fold when compared with the fasting state. Before qualifying for responsible distribution, each CBD product undergoes an analysis in order to identify the product's dosage guide. The dosage guide does take into consideration an individual's weight as CBD's bioavailability is dependent on an individual's body fat concentration. Cannabis from various origins and species has been employed in various forms as 
anti-pain agents for thousands of years. One example is the drug Sativex, which is marketed in the US as Nabiximols, which is a one-to-one -one mixture of CBD and THC derived from marijuana and is indicated for the treatment of spasticity due to multiple sclerosis. Two other synthetic cannabinoid drugs, Marinol, which has the generic name of Dronabinol, and Sesamet have been approved for use in cancer-related anorexia, cachexia syndrome, as well as for nausea and vomiting. But a major disadvantage of cannabis phytomedicine is its psychoactive effects due to the presence of Delta-9 THC. The only phytocannabinoid medicine available as a prescription that does not have Delta-9 THC is Epidiolex, which is a CBD formulation derived from hemp and is indicated to reduce seizures in people living with LGS, Dravet syndrome, and TSC. Epidiolex is different because it is not synthetic. It is an isolated and purified CBD extract from hemp. For Nabiximols or Sativex, the same manufacturer of Epidiolex used peppermint oil to flavor and sweeten the formulation of Nabiximols. But for Epidiolex, a 100 milliliter bottle with 10,000 milligrams of CBD in it, the drug manufacturer chose to use strawberry flavor and sucralose, two inactive ingredients that several people within the rare disease and autism community report having significant side effects from. As a result, several families and patients report that they have turned to the open market to obtain their CBD as a result of either the sucralose or strawberry flavor intolerance or both. To explain why the sucralose has been such a reported concern for so many in the community, a report published in April of 2019 showed that there is a direct relationship between gut bacteria and autism spectrum disorders. In an attempt to find a treatment for the core symptoms of autism, which include social communication disorder and repetitive behaviors. They ultimately concluded the presence of a gut-brain access and by increasing gut microbial diversity, including the beneficial microbes, you can effectively improve behavior and GI symptoms long-term. Now, granted, further studies are warranted. Several parents are now attempting to improve their child's gut microbial diversity. Knowing that, a one 12-week animal study raised some significant concern in the autism community after it had found that sucralose significantly decreased beneficial gut bacteria while the more harmful bacteria seemed to be less affected. What's more, the gut bacteria had still not returned to normal 12 weeks after the experiment had concluded. Now it's important to note that this was an animal study and human studies still need to be done, but these negative effects occurred at a sucralose dosage as low as 1.1 milligram per kilogram. And the FDA's acceptable daily intake for sucralose is five milligrams per kilogram. Other reasons reported that result in patients or carers turning away from the pharmaceutical cannabis derived products in towards the open market is the cost of the product when insurance won't cover it. Lastly, patients with severe underlying liver conditions with a medical team concerned about the patient's ability to tolerate such a high concentration of CBD are turning to the open market to obtain CBD products with lower concentrations. In terms of the open market, initially it can appear as though there is an abundance of options to choose from. At first glance, you will spot various types of cannabis extract products available for purchase in various dosage forms. There are tinctures that function as sublingual drops, vapes, aerosols, edible capsules, tablets, topicals, suppositories, and even the raw flour for smoking, seeping, or the making of your own tincture or tea all available for experimentation. The efficacy of these products are dependent on several factors, however. First, the cannabis that phytocannabinoids are being derived from need to have been grown in such a way that it was not exposed to high levels of pesticides, heavy metals, certain humidity and heat levels that allow the development of mold, yeast, and the overgrowth of microorganisms, etc. Marijuana is typically grown inside to help control the environment in which the plants are growing and to obtain the highest yield of flowers possible. Hemp, however, is grown outdoors, which exposes it to the elements, resulting in guaranteed contamination. CBD extraction from hemp flowers grown outdoors at this point have to be scheduled for decontamination because contamination is inevitable. Unfortunately, not all open market products budget for the decontamination or the testing that is required to make sure that the heavy metals, pesticides, and solvents were successfully removed from the final product. This is why Blaze Therapeutics tests each batch or lot number prior for 
responsible distribution. Assuming the cannabis extract or isolated phytocannabinoids are free of toxins and contaminants, the formulation of the product needs to be designed in such a way that it is bioavailable for its unique dosage form and manufactured in a manner that creates a consistent homogenous product. To this date, not one brand has been able to master the process of developing a consistent homogenous full spectrum product. Even isolated products struggle to maintain consistency, but that is more a direct result of CBD's instability because CBD will degrade if the temperature is too high or if it's exposed to UV light. Either way, it is important to understand that the research therapeutic potential of cannabis-derived products does not automatically translate to a product just because it claims to be derived from cannabis or have CBD in it. Cannabis is a plant that readily absorbs toxins from the soil. It actually has been used to clean soil contaminations around the world and is very effective in doing so. If cannabis is exposed to toxins, it will accept that toxin into its biomass. Unfortunately, most of the hemp grown for medicinal purposes today is grown outdoors, exposing it to the elements. And for this reason, several products on the market are contaminated with arsenic, mercury, lead, and other toxins and microbiology. Regular consumption of these toxins can lead to serious comorbidities that once acquired may be too late to treat. Responsible distribution prevents these harmful products from getting to consumers. In addition, we provide education to every single one of our wholesale clients so that they can appropriately educate their patients or customers. We do not believe in the recall process. Contaminated products should be identified before they are distributed to the public, not after someone gets sick or dies. And as a result of not only the strict legal restrictions placed on hemp, but also the public interest in CBD and other cannabis-derived products, Blaze Therapeutics has developed the responsible distribution system in order to ensure that the healthcare industry, nutraceutical industry, and the average consumer has an opportunity to access CBD products that meets label claims, are unbiased third-party lab tested, and does not violate any federal laws as they are currently written. So far, the responsible distribution model has found that on average, 83% of CBD products available on the open market fail unbiased third-party lab testing for high levels of toxins. The most common toxin found for the past three years in cannabis is lead. So for those of you wondering if the CBD product that you are currently consuming would qualify for responsible distribution, your first step is to look at the label or bottle and identify the batch or lot number. It should say batch or lot before the number. Then you want to find the certificate of analysis that corresponds to that exact batch or lot number. A lot of manufacturers have CEOAs available for download on their websites. If the product doesn't have a batch or lot number printed on the package, do not consume it. There is absolutely no way of tracking that product and you are literally playing Russian roulette with your life by consuming products that do not have batch or lot numbers printed on the packaging. Finding a cannabis product's certificate of analysis shouldn't be hard. Every manufacturer knows that they should make COAs readily available to be provided to anyone who requests it. Once you have obtained a document that the manufacturer claims to be the certificate of analysis for the product you have on hand, you want to look to make sure the batch or lot number Number match the product you have on hand, that the image of the COA is of the product in its final unopened packaging, and you want to pay attention to who paid for the study. If the manufacturer or brand owner paid for the study, that is an automatic conflict of interest. In fact, there are three different COAs available on the market today. The first one is outsourced tested products. They're often referred to as third-party tested on product packaging and descriptions. This is when a manufacturer or brand owner sends a sample of their product to a third-party lab for testing. Those test results come back to the manufacturer or brand owner, and then they decide what to do with the product. Unfortunately, the finished products that are sent to the lab by the manufacturer to be tested are not always the same finished products that get distributed to the public. Additionally, when a product fails lab testing, the manufacturer may still choose to distribute the failed batch or lot in an attempt to avoid the loss of funds that would otherwise be absorbed should the product be appropriately discarded. Often, these products are sold at a significantly reduced 
price to vendors who are strictly financially motivated. The second type are in-house tested products, often referred to as lab tested on packaging and product descriptions, and are not sent to a third-party laboratory, but instead are tested in-house by manufacturers and or the brand owner. These lab tests tend to be extremely limited and often do not test for toxic levels of anything. If a manufacturer is sharing the laboratory results of an in-house tested product to consumers as a valid COA, vendors and consumers are strongly advised to avoid these CBD products for their high potential of being a risk to public health. The one you want is unbiased third-party tested products. That's only referred to as unbiased third-party tested on the packaging. And this is third-party laboratory tests paid for by an unbiased company that does not possess any conflicts of interest to affect its unbiased position. In order for a company to qualify as an unbiased third party, the company cannot have any financial interests in the product's brand. Blaze Therapeutics is currently the only unbiased third party company with an unbiased third party testing program for manufacturers of holistic plant-based products. All COAs for cannabis products should have a full cannabinoid concentration analysis. This allows you to know how much CBD and other phytocannabinoids are in the product. This number often does not match the product's label, but should not be significantly different from the amount printed on the label. In addition to the cannabinoid concentration analysis, all COAs should have a heavy metal analysis. This is vital. And all results for heavy metals should be ND or not detectable. Don't let anyone tell you that a little heavy metal won't hurt you. Any detectable heavy metal amounts taken on a daily or chronic basis will build up and will cause toxicity. Finally, all dietary supplements and holistic products in liquid form should have a residual solvent screening in addition to a full pesticide screening, fungus, and microbiology screening. I know this is a lot, and quite honestly, it's too much for an individual person to have to figure out. And we feel the same way. Your average consumer should not have to worry about whether or not their supplements are toxic or fraudulent or bioavailable. There should be a trusted, responsible distributor making sure that all of these brands and manufacturers are producing holistic products with high therapeutic potentials. And that is essentially what we do at Blaze Therapeutics. We, we do it because we are a company founded by medically complex individuals that cannot afford to consume toxic holistic products. We get it. I personally have three rare genetic conditions myself, and that is why we are motivated to keep sweeping the open market, testing each product for toxins that are harmful for human health, testing therapeutic potential, making sure the product isn't fraudulent and that there is at least one place within the holistic product market that consumers can get unbiased third-party tested products and not a misleading sales pitch. It has been such a pleasure to be a speaker at the Cauda Equina Foundation International Symposium. Just a quick reminder that June 11th is Making Life Beautiful Day, which is a day to celebrate the beauty of surviving life's challenges and the lessons that follow. Those of you interested in getting involved, please be sure to follow the Rare Advocacy Movement for updates. If any of you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask them. If I am unable to answer your questions today, please do not hesitate to reach out to the Blaze Therapeutics team by sending an email to info at blazetherapeutics.com or by simply contacting us through the website at www.blazetherapeutics.com. Thank you.